اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرین واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين Respected viewers, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We were discussing the things for which it's obligatory on a person to take wudu. The first thing, uh, as discussed in the previous session, the first thing we, we discussed in the previous session, of course, was for prayers, whether it be an obligatory prayer or a recommended prayer, it's obligatory on a person to take wudu before that. Because the prayers without wudu, they're not valid. They say, it's in a hadith, it mentions that لا صلاة إلا بطهور there is no prayers but with purification. That means for every prayer you need to purify yourself spiritually, which is either by doing wudu or by doing tayammum or by doing ghusl. So this was the first thing, except salat al mayyit, except the prayers that is said on a mayyit, on a dead body, except that prayer, every other prayer, whether it be obligatory or recommended, it's obligatory to take wudu for that prayer. So this was the first one. And the second one was a forgotten sajda or tashahud. It's obligatory on a person to take wudu before that. If he has made his wudu void in this condition as discussed in the previous session. The third one was to uh, do a tawaf around the Kaaba. If someone wishes to, to circumambulate uh, around the Kaaba, whether it be Hajj or be Umrah, it's obligatory on a person to take wudu. These were the first three things that we discussed in the previous lesson. And here we're going to be discussing the other three things. The fourth one is, if someone has made a nadr, or someone has taken a woe, that is a qasam, a nadr, or, uh, or a qasam, all right, that means he said that if I pass in my exam, I will take wudu, I will do wudu. All right. If if someone if someone makes such a nadr in this condition, it will be obligatory on the person. Whenever the the nadr is fulfilled, he will be taking the wudu. It's ob, it will be obligatory on him. All right. Uh, the way people say that if I pass in my exam, uh, I'll take a fast. I'll fast the other day, or I will fast on the next Friday. Right. So, and when they pass, inshallah, what happens is that it becomes obligatory on them to fast the next Friday according to what they have mentioned in their nadr. Similarly here, if someone uh, makes a nadr to, to do wudu, if he passes the exam, or, or for any other thing, and then that thing happens in this condition, it will be obligatory on the person to do what? To do wudu. So this is the fourth point. The fifth one is, for example, uh, now there are certain things that are not possible, that are not lawful unless they are done with wudu. Like what? Like if someone has, has made a nadr, that if I pass my exam, I will kiss the, one of the verses of the Qur'an. Now touching one of the verses of the Qur'an, it requires uh, for, a per, uh, for a person to touch these verses of the Holy Qur'an, it's obligatory for him to be in the state of wudu, to be in the state of tahara, right? So here also, uh, when his nadr is fulfilled, it will be obligatory on the person to, to take wudu and then touch the writing of the Holy Quran. So this was the fifth point. And the sixth one is that, uh, as we mentioned, that if a piece of a page of the Quran or any such uh, writing on which there is an ayah, a verse of the Holy Quran is written, if it falls inside a toilet, then it's obligatory on a person to take it out. Now here, before taking that thing out, it's obligatory on a person to take wudu. Before taking the, the ayah or any other page, any such holy page from the toilet, it will be, it's obligatory on the person to take wudu when he wishes to wash it. When he wishes to wash that place, it will be obligatory to take wudu, right? Okay. Now here also, within brackets, I should mention that if taking wudu, doing wudu will take so much time that uh, 
it will be a disrespect for that piece of paper to be fallen inside the toilet. Here, the person should take it out immediately. Or one must try not to touch the, the verse from a side of that paper. He must pick it up and should wash it. But before washing it, because when he, while he washes it, uh, he will uh, wipe his hands over that place. So it will be obligatory on the person to take wudu before that. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, as far as touching uh, the, whole, uh, the verses of the Holy Quran is concerned, uh, that means touching not only means to touch something by his hand. No, making any part of our body come in contact with any of the verses of the Quran is touching, is regarded as touching, right? So even if I want to kiss the, the, uh, the writing of the Holy Quran, even in that situation, it will be obligatory on me to take wudu, all right? Because I cannot make any of my body part to come in contact with the verse of the Quran without me being in the state of Tahara, right? So as far as this masala is concerned, so it's it's unlawful for anyone who has who has not taken wudu right but if the quran is translated into any other language if the holy quran is translated in any other language other than arabic it may be persian or be english or be urdu any other language hindi it will be it will not be obligatory to take wudu if you want to touch those letters that are in english or in any other language other than arabic here it will not be obligatory to to take wudu so this is also uh, something regarding touching the holy uh, touching the verses of the holy quran okay now if there is a quran and we are seeing a child coming close to the quran obviously a kid probably three years old five years old ten years old boy okay ten year old boy or an eight year old girl all right, a, a kid is someone who is not baligh according to the rules of Islam. So if the, the child is coming towards the Quran and he wishes to touch the holy uh, verses of the Quran here, it's not obligatory on a person to, to, uh, to take the Quran away from the child. It's not obligatory to, to just stop him from doing this unless it is regarded as disrespect because a kid, he can do anything, all right? So if it's not disrespectful towards Quran, if he simply wishes to touch the holy verse of the Quran, even if he's not in the state of Tahara, it's not obligatory on us to make him, to stop him from doing what he is doing. Okay, the same is the case with someone who is insane. Now, there is someone who is out of his senses, who is, uh, who is uh, a majnoon, Majnoon in Arabic means someone who, who has gone mad, who is insane, who is out of his senses. Okay, not unconscious, but someone who is uh, insane, all right? So the same is the case with an insane person. If he wishes the, uh, to touch the, the Holy Quran, it's not obligatory on any other, on, uh, on, on us. It will not be obligatory on us to, to make him stop from uh, touching the Quran, all right? Because... The, uh, a kid, someone who's not baligh, is a kid. And someone who is not aqil, all right, like an insane person. These people, they do not have any takl uh, they do not have any taklif. All right, Islamic laws, they're not meant for these people. They do not come under these laws. All right, so if someone is baligh and aqil, he is someone who comes and who, who must abide by these laws. But someone who is insane or who is a kid, it's not obligatory on them to follow these laws. And neither it is obligatory on us to stop them from touching the verses of the Quran unless it is regarded as disrespect towards the Quran. If he does something that is disrespectful towards the Quran, here it becomes obligatory on us to do what? It becomes obligatory on us to stop the kid or to stop that insane person from doing what? is being regarded as distress as disrespectful towards the quran okay now here uh, they say that based on obligatory precaution i hope you remember what's obligatory precaution obligatory precaution is something that's not a fatwa 
obligatory precaution is something uh, uh, different from a fatwa. A fatwa is something that we need to follow our, our mujtahid in that uh, rule. But an obligatory precaution, we can refer to some other mujtahid as well. Okay? If he has a fatwa, we can refer to that mujtahid and take his fatwa. All right? And leave the obligatory precaution of our mujtahid. So this is the difference between an obligatory precaution and a fatwa. So they say that on, uh, on the basis of obligatory precaution, it is unlawful for someone who does not have wuzu to touch the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To touch the name of Allah, whether it be in any language, all right? And similarly, the names of the holy household, the names of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam those people who are in Ahlul Bayt, that means the 14 infallibles alayhim salam Similarly, it's obligatory on, on the basis of an obligatory precaution. Uh, one should stay, one should not touch the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, while he's not in the state of wudu. All right. So if there is a piece of paper or any other book, a book in which it's written God, G-O-D, God. All right. Now it's in English language. It's not in Arabic. But he says in the, on the basis of obligatory precaution, it's not uh, allowed to you. It's not allowed for you to touch uh, the holy name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it be in any language. Okay. And similarly, the special attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like what? Like Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, it's not uh, on the basis of obligatory precaution. It's unlawful to touch the word Ar-Rahman, whether it be in any language, whether it be in Arabic or in any other language, it's not permissible to touch these holy names without wudu, all right? And similarly, it's recommended that one does not touch the, the name of the names of the holy infallible Imams alayhim salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and Lady Zahra sallallahu alayhi wa one should not touch their names as well. It's also recommended. Okay. So, one should stay away from uh, these holy names with, uh, if he's not in the state of wudu, one cannot touch, one cannot make any part of his uh, body to come in contact with, uh, with, uh, with what? With these names. Now, here also, sometimes, what do we have? We have those torba on which we prostrate, on which we do sajda. And it's written, Ya Aba Abdullah. Now here, Ya Aba Abdullah, Aba Abdullah refers to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Alright, so it's better not to touch it. But Aba Abdullah, Allah is also written. So here, that torba on which such name is written, it's obligatory not to touch it. It's unlawful to touch it. With without uh, a person being in the state of wudu. Similarly, you might have seen a few people, they, they, they wear uh, necklaces or lockets in their, uh, in their neck and, or, or in their bracelets and it's written, Ya Allah. Or any other verse of the Quran is written on their, uh, on their rings. Now there are rings where it's written, Nasrum min Allahi fathun qareeb. Now here, Nasrum min Allah, here Allah, so one should not touch uh, the gem of this ring, whether it be aqiq or it be any other stone, one should not touch the stone with, without the state, with, without the person being in the state of wudu. So this is also something really important and it should be known and it should be taught, it should be taught towards, uh, to the people. The same is the case with uh, those the, the, the people uh, put on in their necks or in their wrists, the bracelets and the rings. Right? So if it's, if it's the name of Allah or any verse of the Quran, it's obligatory to stay away. And if it's the name of any of the Imams or uh, Masumin alayhim salam, here it's recommended that one should not touch them. That means one should not make his body parts come in contact with that name if he is not in the state of wudu. Okay. Now, if someone is certain that a time of prayers has, has set in and he makes the intention of performing an obligatory wudu. Alright, now these are 
we are towards the end of these masail. Uh, here he states that a person he knows that the time of prayers has set in, and he makes the intention that I'm gonna I'm performing wudu, which is obligatory because as the time of the prayer sets in, it becomes obligatory on us to take wudu. For example, if the time of the Dhuhr prayers is 12 noon, so at 11.30 it was not obligatory on us to take wudu, right? But at 12, it became obligatory on us to do wudu. Why? Because the prayer, because the time of the prayers, it set in. Okay. Now, after taking wudu, he comes to remember or he comes to know that the time has not set in yet. Here, what is... Uh, the hukum, what is the rule regarding his wudu? Here, Ayatollah al uzma al-Sayyid Ali Husseini al-Sistani, he says that his, uh, his wudu is proper, it's, it's completely valid, and he can say his prayers with that wudu. Okay. Now, this is, uh, these were the, the few last mas'alas regarding the things for which it's obligatory to, to do the wudu. Those were six in number, and we discussed them right now. Okay. Now, another uh, important thing that is, what are the things that make our wudu void? How does it become invalid? How is a wudu invalidated? They say that they are, there are seven things that invalidate the wudu. The first one is passing of urine. The second one is passing of feces. Okay, so if someone uses the toilet, all right, uh, and he passes uh, and he urinates or he uh, excretes, all right, or any of the wind, all right, which is off the stomach or the intestine, it comes out. This is, this will also invalidate the wudu. These are the first three things. Okay. The fourth one is to sleep. If someone sleeps in a way that uh, he, his eyes are closed, he is not seeing anything and his ears are not hearing anything. Okay, sleeping is this. Not simply closing one's eyes and listening to what others are talking. Or if someone would talk, he would listen. Alright, so sleeping refers to these two things. That eyes being closed, he is not seeing anything and neither... He is hearing anything. That means if someone speak next to him, he would not hear. This is known as sleeping. So if someone is sleeping or he falls asleep in this condition, it's obligatory. Uh, this, this, uh, this kind of sleeping will also invalidate one's wudu. But if someone simply closes his eyes in a way that he's, he is conscious and he is hearing and he's alert in this condition, no. Uh, his wudu will not be invalidated. So this is the fourth thing that invalidates the wudu. The fifth one is that using those things that make the person lose his mind. Like what? Like the use of intoxicants or the use of uh, anything that brings unconsciousness. This will also invalidate the wudu. This is the fifth one. And the sixth one is istihada. Istihada, which is uh, a kind of blood uh, that is seen by the women. Okay, the women, they see three kinds of blood. Let us discuss this in brief, within brackets. The first one is Hayd. Now, Hayd blood is something that's usual and which is seen in a specific period, a period of six days or seven, between three to ten days. This is mentioned in the narrations. That the blood which is seen between 3 to 10 days is regarded as the blood of hail and which has a specific period and a specific timetable which, uh, which is known and which will be discussed in the later uh, discussions. So this is the first kind of blood that is seen. And uh, the second kind is the blood of nifas. And, now the blood of nifas is the blood that is... Uh, that comes out after when a woman she gives birth to a child this is known as uh, the blood of nifas and the third one is istihada the third one is istihada now this istihada is also what is 
a blood other than these two, other than Hayz and Nifas, will be regarded as a stahada. Okay, so this also invalidates the wudu. And the seventh thing that invalidates the wudu is janaba. When a person comes into the state of janaba, all right, here uh, his wudu it becomes it becomes void. So these are the th uh, the seven things that invalidate one's wudu. Other than these seven things, we do not have anything that invalidates one's wudu. Okay. Now coming on to the to the next part of our discussion, with which is uh, the rules and a certain laws regarding the holy month of Ramadan. Connecting it with the same topic we were discussing, which is Janaba. One of the one of the masail, one of the important masail, which normally people they do not know or they they just uh, take it too simple, is to remain in the state of Janaba before the morning prayers. If a person intentionally, deliberately, if he remains in the state of Janaba before the morning prayers, until the time of the morning prayer sets in, this will invalidate his fast. All right. Here, Ayatollah Sistani, he says in Mas'ala 1589, that in the month of Ramadan, if someone who is Junub, who is in the state of Janaba, if he intentionally does not perform ghosl or he intentionally does not perform tayammum, like what? For example, if someone woke up, now take the example, if the morning prayers, the call of the morning prayers, the adhan of the morning prayers, take the example, if it's at 4.15 in the morning, that means at 4.15, they, uh, the time of the morning prayer sets in. Now if someone wakes up, in the night, in, in the morning of the holy month of Ramadan at 4.13, just two minutes remaining, and he finds himself in the state of Janaba. Now what will this person do? It's obligatory on this person because it, this time is not sufficient to take ghusl. He will not be able to do ghusl. He will not be able to complete his ghusl. In this condition, it's obligatory on the person to do tayammum. Alright? So his duty is to do tayammum. Similarly, if someone wakes up, a bit before that, it's obligatory on the person to do the ghusl and complete it before the time of the morning prayer sets in. Right? So, if someone remains in that state, here it's obligatory on the person not to eat anything, to fast that day. This will invalidate the fast. That doesn't mean that he will be able, he will be allowed to eat and drink anything he wants. No. If he does this, look what he says. He says he must complete the fast of that day with the intention of mafid dhimma. That means he will not intend the fast of the holy month of Ramadan. He will not intend the fast. He will intend mafid dhimma. Whatever is on my duty. Mafid dhimma, it's translated as anything that is on my duty. Whatever my duty is. This is known as mafid dhimma. So he will... Uh, complete the, that fast with the intention of mafid dhimma and then will take another fast, will do the qada of the, this fast after the holy month of Ramadan. Alright? And that qada will also be with the same intention, mafid dhimma. That means whatever is on my duty. This is what is stated in uh, uh, that means has been stated by Ayatollah Al-Udma Asir Ali Husseini Asistani. He says he must complete the fast of that day with the intention of Mafid Dhimma and he must also fast another day after Ramadan. That means he must take the Qadha and he will not intend Qadha, he will intend Mafid Dhimma. That means whatever is in my duty. Sometimes when, sometimes when it's not sure that what my duty is, my duty is to finish the the fast of the holy month of Ramadan or to take the qada when we do not know the duty or when the mujtahid he is not sure or the state is in such a way that uh, the condition is such that I'm not sure here it's obligatory on the person to do what to intend mafid them whatever is in my duty whatever is my duty I will do that okay so this is also another mas'ala now 
the next mas'ala regarding this and probably the last one that we will be discussing today is that if someone knows that he does not have time to perform ghusl or tayammum intentionally he becomes junub all right he knew that he would not be having enough time to perform ghusl or to do the tayammum and then he becomes junub intentionally and then in the end he performs tayammum all right in spite he that means he had uh, uh, or if or he had time but he delayed the ghusl that means for example he woke up at three before the fajr prayers at three o'clock and the time of the morning prayers it sets in at 4 15. all right so he had one hour and 15 minutes to do the ghusl but he did not do it until the time was too short that he had to do the tayammum in this condition even if the person has committed a sin he will, be com he will be regarded as a sinner, but his fast will be all right. The, the, the fast, the psalm, the rosa that he will be taking on that day, it will be all right, although the person will be regarded as a sinner. Be why? Because he should not have uh, delayed the ghusl so that the time it becomes too short that he won't be able to perform the ghusl and in the end he would do the tayammum and and just uh, after the morning prayers, he will do the ghusl and say his prayers, right? So here also the person will be regarded as a sinner, but will not be, but will not invalidate one's fast.